Hey guys, Caleb here, welcome back, and this is the DJI Ronin 4D Cinema Camera. And today we'll see if it is worth all of the hype surrounding it, and talk about why this camera both delights and upsets me to no end but not in the way you would expect. I have time stamped this video so you can hop around and find a section that you're looking for. And as a disclaimer, DJI did send me this camera for a couple weeks to play with as a pre-production unit, but I have not been paid for this review or my thoughts and I am not keeping the camera. Also, this is the 6K version of the camera. At some point in the future, there will also be an 8K version and I'll have everything mentioned down in the description. There is so much to unpack with this camera. So we're going to actually work the entire camera from the front front to the back and we're going to start with what I'm calling the sensor head. The Ronin 4D has a full frame sensor sitting behind the DJI DX mount which can be adapted to DJI's DL mount for use with their lenses of which there are currently three options. Alternatively you can use adapters to mount other lenses but there are some limitations. First at launch there are only a few adapters available. There is a Leica M mount and an upcoming Sony E and I believe there's a PL mount in the works as well. The second limitation is the size and weight of your lens. The 4D can handle up to 800 gram lenses and while size isn't currently listed you can see that there's only so much room for lenses to fit on this gimbal and longer lenses won't balance correctly as there's just not enough room to move the entire sensor back. There are four screws on the back of the sensor head that allow for a counterbalance weight which can be purchased separately. DJI has crammed in nine filtration stages which is just bonkers to me on such a small sensor unit. Next up let's talk about the LiDAR rangefinder which is mounted just above the sensor. Sensor. This can be used to read and control focus. A focus module is available separately and mounts below the sensor head and can be used to control manual focus lenses. Then we have the gimbal. The sensor head is mounted to a three axis gimbal and the entire sensor and gimbal assembly can be removed as one whole unit, making sensor swapping easy. Each axis has really nice quick release locks and you can adjust the balance of the gimbal in two places, at the sensor head and where the gimbal meets the Z arm. And the Z arm really really is what makes the 4D special. It adds a fourth Z axis, which compensates for vertical movement. And when not in use, the Z arm can be locked down via a camera base plate. Next up, we have the main body. On the front and bottom, there are sensors for analyzing and controlling the Z axis movement. On the right side, there is a handle mount, monitor output, 3.5 millimeter mic and headphone jacks, HDMI output, and DC power input. On the left side, we have several controls, including settings lock switch, record, Z arm and on and off button. There's also a multi control wheel which controls focus by default, a set of gimbal controls which we'll get into a little bit later, and the media area which includes a USB jack for recording to external SSDs as well as a CF Express card slot or Pro SSD module for DJI Pro SSDs which is sold separately and is required for recording in 6K or ProRes RAW. On the back of the camera you can add several modules to expand functionality. The stock configuration is a simple battery plate using DJI's TB50 batteries. On average, I find myself getting one to two and a half hours of operation depending on gimbal use and the accessories attached. You can also use the battery charger to power the camera directly by bolting it in place of the battery plate. At this time, there is no V-mount or gold mount battery option, but I could totally see third-party manufacturers taking care of that in the future. DJI also sells a video transmitter module and has plans to release an expansion module with dual XLR inputs, SD outputs and time code connectivity. On the top of the body, you'll find a really strong top handle that can be completely removed. It has a rocker switch which controls the tilt of the gimbal and an M button which activates sport gimbal mode when held down. Again, we'll get into all the gimbal goodies later on in the video. Attached to the top handle, we have the monitor. This 5.5 inch 1000 nit display is the primary way to change settings on the camera. There is a really nice friction mount bolted onto the back which can be used on the center or left of the monitor. The monitor supports touch and has 14 buttons and a dial to help you control camera settings. Across the top and bottom of the display, you have your primary settings and power, media, gimbal, focus, and audio information is displayed on the left. Changing these settings can be done by tapping and scrolling through options or using the buttons on the top and the bottom to control corresponding options. Pressing and holding a setting will sometimes bring up a hidden menu, giving you even more control. For example, holding down the shutter setting allows you to change the shutter unit between speed and angles, which is fantastic. Holding down white balance allows you to add custom white balance, temperature, and tint, or you can measure the white balance
response and save it as a preset. Holding the time code setting allows you to change several variables in a separate menu. On the back of the monitor, you'll find three shortcut buttons. On the left side of the display, you'll find a jog wheel slash select button for scrolling through various settings, a playback button, and menu button. Pressing that button takes us into the menu, which is very well organized. It reminds me a lot of Blackmagic's camera menus, which is a very, very good thing. Here you can choose from the eight primary settings tabs. Each tab has several pages and you can navigate by tapping on the left and right arrows or by using the page title shortcut at the top, which is just genius. You can also save all of the camera settings to a user profile, which can be switched between or exported for use with other cameras. Next, we have the camera grips. These can easily be added and removed with the flip of a locking lever and adjusting the angle of the handles is absolutely brilliant. Simply press the silver tab to adjust and release to lock the handles when you find a comfortable position. This can even be done while holding the camera in midair. I really, really like these handles and wish every camera had them now. Each handle is loaded with buttons and other controls. The left handle has a joystick on the top for controlling the gimbal, a focus and gimbal tracking button, an exposure button which brings up either a waveform, false color, or zebra meter which can be figured in the menu. There's also a hidden M button where your middle finger lands that activates the sport gimbal mode, and a trigger button which locks the gimbal from panning or tilting and can be double pressed to center the gimbal. You can lock the entire left grip by using the little switch on the side. The right handle is super exciting as it has a giant focus knob with a ton of functionality. You can use it to change focus when in manual mode or temporarily take over focus when in auto mode, which is brilliant. It can be used to change a few camera settings by pressing the mode button on the handle and use the focus knob to change those settings. While doing this, the focus knob switches from a smooth focus wheel to a clicky tactile wheel, which feels so, so good. There's also a focus assist button that can be programmed to turn on peaking, focus magnify, or the LiDAR waveform. On the side of the grip, there is an AF toggle button and a trigger button that locks the Z arm in place, keeping the sensor from moving up and down. This trigger button can also be double pressed to turn the Z axis on and off. Finally, there is the thumb button to stop and start recordings. The final component of the 4D camera system is the high bright remote monitor. This wireless display works with the video transmitter module I mentioned earlier to give you complete control of the camera wirelessly while also offering a really nice 7 inch 1500 nit HD display. On the back of the remote monitor, there are two power options, DJI's WB37 battery or Sony MPF batteries using an adapter plate. Just below the battery plate, there's an access panel that can be replaced with an optional expansion module that includes HDMI and SDI out as well as DC power in. On the side of the monitor, we have some inputs and outputs with some wild specs. There's a headphone jack for monitoring audio audio in real time, a micro SD card slot that can be used to record the camera stream at up to 1080p 60, an HDMI input for monitoring other devices, and a USB-C jack for UVC live streaming and firmware updates. Those last three features will be available in future firmware updates. And the monitor can also be used with the left and right grips to have even more control. On the main screen, you can change several settings and controls with touch. DJI states that the monitor has a built-in gyro sensor to control the gimbal of the Ronin 4D, but this isn't available yet, so I was not able to test it. Changing camera settings, focus, and even the gimbal's position was flawless, and I was really impressed with how low the latency was. And all of this works up to a range of 20,000 feet, according to DJI. I didn't do a range test, but the monitor worked flawlessly for me, even when using it outside of the building that the camera was in. And finally, the remote monitor gives you several other features like exposure tools, LUTs, markers, as well as a way to read the status of your connection and the supported resolution received by the monitor. Now let's get into the headline feature of this cinema camera the built-in gimbal and Z-arm. Balancing the 4D is a breeze. The camera can tell you if something is going wrong and how to fix it, and even shows you how to adjust and balance the gimbal for optimal performance. The 4D uses a gimbal and Z-arm to stabilize the sensor 
and each have their own modes and settings. The gimbal has three modes, off, which turns the gimbal completely off for storage or shots where you don't need the gimbal, lock on, which locks the sensor from panning or tilting, and follow, which smoothly follows your camera movement. When you're in the follow mode, there are three options available to choose from, PF or pan follow, which will only pan, so no tilt or roll, PT, which is pan and tilt follow, so everything but roll, and FPV, which has pan, tilt, and roll follow, so this will full Fully follow your camera movement. To manually control the gimbal, you can also use the joystick on the left grip or top handle. And if you need to recenter the gimbal, you can use the button on the side of the body or double press the left trigger. The Z axis provides vertical stabilization using several camera sensors. To turn the Z arm on and off, press the 4D button or double tap the right grip trigger button. Just make sure it isn't locked before you use it. Once on, there are two Z arm modes, which can be toggled using this button. Lock will try to keep the gimbal head and sensor from moving up and down. This is great if you want to keep your sensor at a specific height and just run or walk with the camera. Follow will smoothly move the gimbal head up and down to match the height of your camera. When in follow mode, you can temporarily switch to lock mode by pressing and holding the right trigger button. Now let's talk about another great feature on this camera, and that is the Active Track Pro. This feature allows you to lock onto a person or object in your frame and have the gimbal track it. Simultaneously, you can also track autofocus. This mode is even smart enough to freeze and keep your framing correct. So if you want your subject to stay on the left part of the screen, you just frame them up there, start tracking, and no matter what, the gimbal will keep them on that side of the frame, which is just amazing. The camera automatically recognizes people's faces, but you can also manually track objects by dragging a box around your subject on the camera monitor. And then we have the gimbal's sport mode. If at any time you need to quickly move the camera and want the gimbal to lock in place, you can activate sport mode by pressing and holding the M button on either the top handle or the left grip. When you release the M button, the gimbal will resume your previously set gimbal mode. And all of these settings can be customized and changed and tweaked and saved in the menu system. Next up, we have LiDAR and Focus. The Ronin 4D uses the LiDAR rangefinder to read your scene, and then the camera uses that information to either focus the lens automatically or display that information on a focus waveform so you can manually control focus. There are two autofocus modes, AF and AFM. AF is just autofocus, and AFM will turn on autofocus and turn the focus wheel on the grip, which will match the movement of your lens. While the camera performs auto focus at any time you can take manual control of the focus using the wheel and whenever you want autofocus to take back control you just let go of the wheel this is just brilliant and it's one of the features i've enjoyed using the most the camera also has three focus areas or as dji likes to call them roi or region of interest we have spot which uses a small box that you can move around using touch wide which focuses in a wider area and smart which can detect faces or track using the 40s active track mode Mode, which we've already covered. Overall, focus is pretty impressive on this camera. Because it uses LiDAR, it doesn't need a bunch of light in your scene to work. While focus works well, focus transitions can be very jarring, and there really isn't a good way to change how smooth these transitions are. Hopefully this improves with future updates. All of this works flawlessly with DJI's DL lenses out of the box, but you can use other lenses to work with the LiDAR rangefinder. Simply adapt the lens, add focus gears and a focus motor if needed, and start calibrating the lens's focus range. The camera walks you through each step, and you can save each calibration in the camera, which is great. I had no problems using my vintage prime and even tried my Sony Zeiss 5518, which the camera recognized and I was able to control focus through the adapter without issue. At first, this can be a little finicky and some lenses require multiple calibration points where you do infinity, minimum focus, and several points in between. With some manual focus lenses, autofocus was a little more difficult to set up, but for all lenses I tried, doing manual focus and having that waveform, that focus waveform, was brilliant and worked for me every single 
single time. All right, so now let's dive into the video specs of this cinema camera, finally. And I'm gonna show you at this point a chart with all of the resolutions, frame rates, data rates, and aspect ratios of the Ronin 4D. Do keep in mind that some of these settings will enforce an aspect ratio change or crop onto your footage, which are shown here as red. Green settings give you the full 17 by nine DCI frame, and some of these settings require you to use the Pro SSD module and a Pro SSD stick to record, which I have highlighted in purple. So we have 2K, 4K, 6K, and for our frame rates, 2397 up to 120 frames per second. And there are three codecs available, H.264, ProRes, and ProRes RAW. The H.264 is a 420 10-bit file that uses long GOP compression. So in short, it will deliver smaller file sizes, but your editing machine will weep bitterly when playing this footage back. My 16-inch MacBook Pro had a fit every single time I worked with these H.264 files from this camera, and using these files was just really tricky. But you could, of course, transcode your footage and get around this. The ProRes and ProRes RAW on the camera I tested were only available in the HQ variant, which absolutely gobbles up storage. It looks like we will be getting ProRes 422 in a future update, which is great. And that brings us to image quality and dynamic range. I compared the H.264 image on my A7S III with the 4D's footage, and they were incredibly close. Honestly, I slightly preferred the 4D's image, but I couldn't tell you exactly why. But something about the log curve and grading the footage felt more like a cinema camera and not a mirror camera. When it comes to the ProRes RAW footage, things are incredible here. It is so easy to get a really solid image without a lot of effort in post-production. Dynamic range of the Ronin 4D is listed at 14 stops. Unlike Gerald and Don, I don't have a way of measuring this, but at no point did I feel like I was missing or not getting enough dynamic range out of the camera. And that brings us to low light. The Ronin 4D has dual native ISO at 800 and 5000. After testing the ISO range on the 4D, I found that 6400 ISO is probably the highest I would personally go. And I also noted that blue objects or colors had much higher noise than other colors or neutral objects in each shot. Not sure if this is a bug or something else, but thought I'd share that here. Next, we have rolling shutter. I would say it's similar to other full frame sensors with comparable megapixel counts. Not better, not worse. Before we get to the things I don't like about this camera, let's talk pricing. The base price gives you a combo kit, which includes the camera and a bunch of accessories, which I'll list here. For the 6K version of this camera, you're looking at $7,200. From there, there are a bunch of accessories you can either skip or pick up. When it comes to functionality, getting that base combo kit will give you a 4K non-RAW camera. Adding the Pro SSD module and one terabyte Pro SSD will give you full 6K and RAW recording capabilities. Add a focus motor and an extra battery, and now you have a more complete system. So the Ronin 4D is fantastic for all the reasons I've already mentioned. Now let's get to the things I don't like about this camera. Battery life is not great on this camera, and I kind of give this a pass because there's a lot going on. So if you have all of the Z-axis and gimbal stuff going in your recording, that's a lot of power to be drawing from a single battery. And at the same time, if you go with a bigger battery, now you have more weight, which is another con. This thing is brutal on the body. There's also no support at this time for dual media recordings. So you have to choose between the CF Express or SSDs, but not at the same time. Then we have the fact that H.264 is brutal in post-production, or at least it was for me. DJI lenses work flawlessly, but there are only three of them. They're very expensive and only F2.8. Audio on this camera is not really that great out of the box. Hopefully this will be alleviated with the XLR expansion unit in the future. The startup time of this camera is is definitely something to keep in mind. It takes a while for everything to turn on and start running. Then we have the biggest issue I have with this camera, and it's crazy, but hear me out. I wish DJI offered a gimballess version of this camera. I know it's nuts, but every single time I use a different camera, all I can think about is how I miss the features that this camera has the grips, amazing LiDAR features, some of the best controls and wireless monitoring I've ever seen, that beautiful focus wheel, and a great sensor and image. And while the 4D does its job pretty much perfectly in my opinion, I often need a normal cinema camera form factor. And the 4D just doesn't work well for that style of filming. The sensor is way too high when the gimbal is locked off for most tripod and handheld work. The sensor is slightly wobbly even when locked down, and you can't really use larger lenses as 
Philip Bloom pointed out in his great review. At this point, you might be screaming at me, then just buy a cinema camera from Canon, Sony, Red, or any of those other guys. But I don't want those cameras anymore. I want this camera with some of these amazing features just without the gimbal setup. And if you remove the gimbal, the weight would go down. I would imagine the cost would go down and there'd be other benefits like the battery lasting longer and more. So in short, the DJI Ronin 4D has ruined other cameras for me and I'd be the happiest camera operator in the world if they released something maybe like a Ronin 1D to complement the Ronin 4D. Future fantasy DJI cameras aside, if you need a solid cinema camera with the best stabilization in the industry and the option to add accessories for any filming scenario, DJI has your back with one of the most spectacular cameras I've used in a very, very long time. So that is gonna wrap up this review. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future videos. Check out my camera guides and LUTs over at academy.dslrvideoshooter.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you in the next video.